Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I am Roger Killen, the organizer. This evening, Catherine and Dwayne O'Kane from ClearMind are training us on overcoming self-doubt and becoming resilient in the face of adversity. Uh, but first, a question for each of Dwayne and Catherine. Dwayne, you're first. Dwayne, your bio says, quote, all that we strive for is held hostage in the middle of every moment, every relationship, and every situation. Can you throw some light on those words? <laughs> it's a big thought for a few words, Dwayne. It's throw some enlightenment on those words, perhaps, <laughs> huh? Yeah, uh, when I first wrote this, I wrote, uh, heaven is held hostage in the middle of every moment, every dialogue, every relationship, every waking moment, if we uh, dared to become totally present to it. Uh, here in the Western world, we spend so much of our time waiting for that special place, the special relationship, that special moment where everything is finally going to arrive, but it's actually in the middle of everything that you're in the middle of. Every second counts, even standing in an elevator, uh, and there's someone in the elevator with you're, you're with having a relationship that is 15 seconds long. How do I maximize that? How do I make it real? Not strategically, but authentically and genuinely. And the more we step in, which we're going to be talking about here tonight a lot, stepping in, staying in and looking around, everything that we strive for is already here. If we ever, ever became present enough to witness it. Mm, great answer. Thank you, Dwayne. Now, Catherine, your skill testing question. Uh, you have uh, recently published a book titled Real, colon, The Power of Authentic Connection. Mm -hmm. Please tell me what an authentic versus an inauthentic connection is. Well, I am going to start just by emphasizing the importance of connection. And we know for sure that research has shown that humans are happier, healthier, live longer when we have strong relationships. And despite the fact that we are apparently more connected than at any other time in history, we are also the loneliest. And this isn't just an artifact of COVID. I think COVID has kind of shed a light on the dilemma that many humans are facing. but we are lonely people and we do not do well when we're lonely and the trick to authentic connection is being able to connect not not on a sort of surface strategic level but a deeper emotional level and that requires courage and it requires vulnerability so it's it's a skill actually to learn how to connect with people from an emotional real place that is what ultimately helps us to feel held, that someone is at our back, and that's what radically changes the quality of our life. Beautiful, beautiful. And Brian, thank you very much for posting a link to that book. In the <laughs> we've, got our, we've got our people we've out got there. Some, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you've got your plants. Well done. Yeah. Good, good foresight. Audience, mm -hmm. if you have any questions for uh, Catherine or Dwayne, type them into the chat. And at lulls in their presentation, if there are any lulls, I will pose your <laughs> questions to them. Uh, Catherine and Dwayne, are you ready to rock the stage? We sure. are totally ready. Then take it away. She's all yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> ClearMind's been around since 1990. Uh, I started it uh, coming out of a, a clinical depression and uh, needed to create something that actually made sense to me in this world. I met Catherine in 1996. Uh, she took over completely in 1997. <laughs> took me a, a full year. Um, no, we joined forces and we met in 96 and joined forces. And in 1998, we purchased a, uh, a 16 acre retreat center out in Langley, which was a huge, huge step because up to that point, um, uh, uh, we were spending $5,000 a month to rent facilities to host our workshops. We teach personal growth workshops, quite intense personal growth workshops. We're both in the field of psychology. And uh, so I thought the mortgage is only gonna be $5,000. Why on earth wouldn't we buy a place and, and stop throwing this $5,000 a month away? 
So we were very, very naive. We had no business sense whatsoever. In retrospect, I'm glad we didn't because we probably wouldn't have purchased this place. Um, in any event, uh, it, because of my clinical depression for six or seven years pr uh, prior to that, um, I had kind of gone off grid in terms of how I, I was uh, uh, living my life. I was, I was a family therapist uh, with social services in the province of BC before that. But now I was doing my own private work and um, uh, sort of created a, 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 a company where I ignored my, our taxes because I, I, I was just coming back from, from that depression six or seven years earlier. And, it, and when prior to forming a company in 1998, when you purchased this property, you, in your personal taxes, you could kind of ignore it for a year or two or three or four. And the government doesn't seem to mind that hypothetically, much. Hypothetically, hypothetically, hypothetically. You can do that. not advising anyone to do that. <laughs> That's just where I was at the time. I'd survived uh, this 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 state I was in years earlier. And uh, but when you when you incorporate, you can't do that. You have to do your year end. You have to have your books up to spec. And I I, I actually didn't know that. Uh, so we were in arrears with uh, with GST significantly about $30,000 at that time, which was a lot of money. For us now, it would probably be a half a million dollars. And uh, I was off to England. I was off to England to open up London, where I was gonna be speaking in front of 400 people. It was the largest audience I had spoken to uh, up to that time. And I knew no one. It was just somebody, someone there that read one of my articles and saw me speaking at another conference in San Francisco that said, come on, I'm gonna sponsor you, come on to London. And so I, I got my suitcase and I'd already been traveling a fair amount teaching. We were teaching in Sweden and the US and across Canada, but London was a, a new spot. And so he gave, the sponsor gave me very brief directions to find the Lancaster Hotel when I got there, just outside of Paddington, he said, Paddington Station. So I, I, f I fly economy on a, a, a midnight flight because it was the cheapest, because we had no money. I had arthritis in my left hip, uh, cleverly disguised, but I could not really walk a block or two without having to sit down and rest it. I have since had that repaired. I had a hip replacement 10 years later, but at that time I was pretty much handicapped. And I also couldn't afford to have luggage that had wheels. So there I am going to London with this huge suitcase unable to walk, in total jet lag, with a suitcase that I have to carry, and I have to find the Lancaster Hotel. This is before Googling and cell phones. and So I haven't slept for 16 hours. It's midday in London. It's pouring rain out. It's January and it's cold. And I'm looking for the Lancaster Hotel. And so I asked somebody, where's the, Lanc the, the Lancaster Hotel? And, and he said, well, there's three of them. There's Lancaster Suites, there's Lancaster Hotel, and there's the Royal Lancaster. And so I ended up walking circles and really in, in a great, great deal of pain, totally just destroyed by this day and this lack of sleep and not feeling very good or comfortable at all. I finally get to my hotel, I find it. And in those days, because we didn't have internet, I just, I, I just got to my hotel room, then I went down to the lobby to log on to a computer there to find out how, what's going on back home at the office. And my one office person at that time said, uh, Revenue Canada just seized our bank account uh, because you owe them $30,000 in GST. Huh? I had pulled many rabbits out of the hat prior to this, but I had no rabbits left. I was completely, completely done. I didn't know what on earth I was going to do. And I had to give a talk the next morning and was really, really pondering whether I even will. If anybody has seen that movie Apocalypse Now, uh, probably I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself with that, but if the opening scene of Charlie Sheen in a hotel room in Cambodia, completely losing it and thrashing his hotel room. That's what I felt like doing. I didn't do that, but it was a night of complete. Because you're a good helping professional. You didn't yeah. <laughs> thrash the room. Abject terror and horror. 
about what a, what a, I was not in the mood to give a talk on on feeling better <laughs> ultimately. So these these are these are moments these these where you re have to recalculate. You know, uh, in short, I mean these moments are really really important. Are we going to fall to our fate there, which I thought I was like I'm just I'm just going to die. Like there's no way out of this. I'm just gonna. I'm. I have no right. I don't belong. I'm gone. Or am I gonna rise to my destiny? And that's the that's the 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 the, the question that unconsciously is riding through my brain. So we want to show you a little ad uh, that I put out by Jeep recently. We just love it. We're using it uh, here and there. On it's called recalculating. Are we, uh, there we go. In 15 meters, turn left. Recalculating. Go straight to a steady job. Recalculating. Stay single until you're 34. Recalculating. Follow the company rules. Recalculating. Start a diet. Recalculating. 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 Introducing your all new Jeep Compass. Love, hope, happiness. Whatever your destination, there's a million beautiful, ever-changing ways to get up there. So aside and apart, apart from the, the pitch for Jeep there, the point of that commercial really, really holds to, true. Evolution is an irresistible force. As the quote says up top there, everything changes but change. We can make plans, but one thing that we know for absolute sure is that life has its own agenda and things are going to happen that you didn't plan for. Can we all agree on that <laughs> in these COVID days? <laughs> and how you relate to these unexpected happenings or obstacles or change is key. When you run into an obstacle, it can stop you or you can decide to use it as a stepping stone toward your goal instead. So what if these apparent obstacles that we run into in our lives that internally, whether it's internal or external, make us want to collapse? What if these were really opportunities? The fact is that all graduations that we go through in life are preceded by a crisis. All, all graduations are preceded by a crisis. And we know this as helping pro professionals in particular because people come into our office, change is, is typically forced by difficult situations and that's the beauty in the middle of these obstacles so in as with this picture just as this oak tree this acorn has within us in it this impulse to become an oak tree so as humans do we have a drive to become our full selves and what psychology means by the term resilience just means the ability to adapt and grow through life's changes instead of getting stuck. Our brain is what distinguishes us as a species, but despite the fact that we humans consider us pr ourselves primarily thinking creatures, the foundation for resilience is actually emotional and not intellectual. There's that little slow cooker. So we're going to do a really quick review of the role of emotion in motivation and decision making in terms of the research that's out there around it. We make better decisions when thought is informed by feeling. Many of us think that the better decisions are made when we just sort through the facts of the situation, but the reality is, and we know this by studying people with brain damage, particularly in the areas, emotional centers of our brain, we make bad decisions when we are disconnected from the emotional component, when we can't imagine the feelings that would be attached to those decisions. And this is particularly true in areas where we have to make some kind of judgment about appropriate risk. 
Emotions also color our perception, meaning that if I'm feeling a particular way, it's like a color on my glasses and I look at the world through that color and I tend to see in my world around me what is consistent with the feeling that I brought into the situation. So they bias us in terms of how we see what's in front of us. And they also carry forward from one situation to the next. So if I have a big fight with my spouse before I leave for work, for example, and then I go to work, as I'm working, I am more likely to be cranky and irritable with my coworkers, despite the fact that they had nothing to do with she'll, the fight that I had with my spouse. She'll see me in the every, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so the emotional state that we're in looks to prove itself as we're wandering through our worlds. What we see on the outside says more about what's on our inside than what's actually on the outside. What do you see here? If you really answer honestly and you haven't seen this uh, kind of optical illusion before, you would say A, B, C. And then I would say, look at this next one. Are you sure it's A, B, C? It's absolutely the identical same figure in the middle on both. If you come from planet, the planet numbers, you're going to see 13. If you come from the planet alphabet, you're going to see the letter B. The meaning it has is determined by the context that we surround it by. And the context we surround it by is what we bring into it. As Catherine said, we, we're all uh, finding what we're looking for. If we're in a state of anger and fear, guess what we're going to see in front of us? We're going to see evidence of that to, su to support that internal uh, uh, state that you're in. If you're in a state of feeling safe and friendly or caring, you're going to witness what is consistent with that. So this is a really humble idea. If we could actually realize that we're only seeing a very, very small portion of what actually is, if we became more curious about what, what might be as opposed to what we are calling our reality real, real we can start. Do you want to tell about the guy on the trail? Yeah. Um, uh, a while back, uh, last fall, uh, we had a, there, was a, there was a period of time where we had like 20 or 30 days uh, that had some kind of precipitation or rainfall. And here in Vancouver, when the sun finally comes out, you know, it is, it's like a glorious, glorious day. And we live close to the Capilano River here in North Vancouver, and there's a beautiful trail that I went walking down, and I ran into this fellow that I'd seen before. And I stopped and I said, it's a, what a beautiful day this is. And he turned to me and he said, yeah, but it's not going to last. There you go. Who was right? <laughs> we were there actually both, go. we both were, but we were both finding what we were looking for. And all of us are all day long. Emotion also influences depth of thought. So when we feel safe emotionally, we're able to think more completely and deeply about a situation, which allows us to see and consider all the range of possibilities in front of us, including potentially new possibilities that are in front of us. Fear, anxiety, and anger are emotional states that trigger a really quick response based on a really quick surface mm -hmm. judgment about what's happening in front of us. And that's because of our evolutionary wiring. From when, way back when, when we were living and surviving in small tribes together, right? You hear a rustle in the bush, you see a little glimpse of fur, you're not going to take some time and analyze the situation to decide what size of animal is it? Is it a bear? And if so, what species? No. In that moment, you are just going to get out of there. We are wired to make really quick decisions based on the emotional response we have to what's in front of us. And so fear and anxiety in particular kick our brain into simple tunnel vision, black and white thinking so that we can quickly take action to survive, which is important if there is in fact a predator in the bush but otherwise completely limits our ability to see all the possibilities that are in front of us. So here is the thing about self-doubt. 
When I say the word self-doubt, we all consider it a kind of mental situation, right? We're telling ourselves we're not good enough. It's a thought. The reality is it's a kind of toxic combination of feelings, fear, anxiety, and shame that are attached to a thought like not good enough. And the power of self-doubt is in the feeling component of that experience. It's the emotional aspect of it. The way that most adults try to deal with uncomfortable feelings is by numbing them in some way. It could be by retreating into our heads and trying to think our way through the situation obsessively. It could be by distracting ourselves somehow with internet, with television. It could be through more potentially destructive behaviors like drugs, alcohol. The thing about feelings is we can't selectively numb ourselves. We can't say, I want to live a joyful, passionate, full out, alive existence, but I never want to feel scared. I never want to feel angry. I never want to feel sad. And that is because all of these feelings use exactly the same network in our body. It all travels on the same channels. So for example, if you think for a minute about how fear feels in your body and how excitement feels in your body, that state is very much the same. So in order, to, our first step here is to understand that if we want to feel these fabulous good feelings, we have to learn how to feel, period. In other words, if you want to feel better, you have to get better at feeling. Dwayne likes those little twists. <laughs> One of his favorite things. Yeah, and uh, as Catherine said, it's the same neural network that is being activated when you feel fear as opposed to when you feel excitement. Purpose. To, to, to have a sense of purpose in our life we have to utilize that same network. Otherwise, it's just being uh, strategic um, and mathematical or robotic as opposed to felt. Every part of who we are and what we are has to be involved and activated in this pursuit of finding and, and, and realizing our purpose in life. We cannot do it strategically. As Roger was saying earlier on about the, the three seconds of making a first impression. That has to be authentic and real, not strategic. What am I gonna do to maximize my three seconds with somebody? You've already lost it. As opposed to who do I have to be in this, these three seconds? Can I be all of who I am and what I am? So the motivator when things get hard is to be able to connect to that purpose by allowing yourself to, to accept every part of who I am and what I'm going through there. And so these two things are, the, are flip sides, right? Self-doubt and those, the, the, the negative feelings associated with it, that's the underbelly. When we flip it right side up, it becomes purpose, excitement, passion, and caring. This is what's on the other side. It all requires ultimately coming to a place where we're gonna discover the courage to care and what does that really mean? As personal investment in your job or where you volunteer or your relationship increases. And our jobs become very important to us. What we're involved in, where we invest in, becomes very important to us. So then does vulnerability. Because when something or someone is important, we will naturally feel vulnerable because it, 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 it will activate our memory of what happened the last time we made something or someone that important. If they're that important or it's or our job is that important, then that job or that person has power now. And we secretly unconsciously do not want someone to have power because it could be abused. We get scared that what we have could be taken away. So we start putting on a face of not wanting to want. And we start hiding the depth of our vulnerability and our fear, and we represent defenses instead of what we're defending against. So this, it, this, when something becomes important, it wakes up all kinds of memories uh, 
in our life. And that's both a curse and a blessing, isn't it? I mean, it's a curse because, oh my God, I don't want to feel that. What is, what is that feeling? Where does it come from? But actually the blessing is it's also a window to that feeling because you brought that with you. It's not caused by what's happening in front of you. You brought that with you. Dwayne and I are psychotherapists and we're talking about your feelings and now we're gonna talk about your childhood. It is what open? we do. <laughs> are you open for a question? I ask it and, and we may be answering it very mom momentarily. But we're very after. aware of t our time too. Yeah. So ask you opened that. a loop in terms of the Lancaster Hotel? Oh yes, we're coming back to that. Oh, yeah, I'll be coming back to all of that. Then pass, off you go. Excellent. You, you think I'm going to leave leave myself yes. stranded in a hotel <laughs> forever in your minds? No, we're no, 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 no. So, to your childhood, where did this all begin? Human beings are wired for connection. We are elephants. We are not grizzly bears. The very first part of us that gets wired up very shortly after we're born is our emotional network in our cortex and our limbic system. And that facilitates bonding with our caregivers, which means love. We have very strong feelings of love and connection right off the bat. And we are wired for them. It's fundamental to who we are. These emotional, this emotional aspect of who we are continues to be primary all the way through our childhoods. Our cortex or our thinking brain doesn't start to kick in until about age five or seven. The first time you have a memory that's like a little story you tell yourself, meaning it's sequential, this happened, then this happened, that's when that part of your brain is first coming online. And this is important to understand because we don't have the ability to understand nuances about what's happening when we're young. Our whole world experience is through our feeling network and through our relationships and through our sense of connection with others. We feel safe when we feel connected. And at some point in time in our young lives, something happens where that connection is severed. And it might be something a moment that's really obvious, a traumatic moment as when a child is abused or neglected in some way. And sometimes it's through a much more subtle moment as when some part of us isn't seen or heard or validated in some way. And in those moments, those painful moments, Again, this isn't a, a thought process, but I'm going to describe it as if it is so that you can understand how it goes. In those moments, we get flooded with fear. We think, oh no, what is wrong with me? How come this is happening? It's my fault. And those feelings are so big and we have nowhere to go with them. So we kind of cut them off and lock them down in what we metaphorically call the basement. So I'm going to give you a quick personal example. Uh, when I was young, I was a kid in a small town with a particular circle of girls that I went through my whole early life with. And I never fit into my peer group. I would kind of find my way in briefly and then something would happen and I'd be out again. And that in and of itself was, was a, an example of one of these disconnected moments for me and particularly the fact that it was repeated over time. I ended up feeling like who I was as I was, was not good enough. And this was compounded in a, what I think most people would call a more obviously traumatic moment that occurred when I was at a sleepover at a good friend's house, the person I would have called my best friend at the time. And while I was sleeping over, I ended up being sexually molested by her older brother. She had two older brothers. And that was a difficult experience for sure, but the more difficult part of it occurred after. I was walking home uh, with her and I told her what happened and she said, do not tell your parents. My brother will get into so much trouble. And then she started asking me which brother it was. I would have been about eight at the time. One of her brothers would have been 13, 14, the other a couple of years older. And I didn't actually know which brother it was. She asked me all kinds of questions. Eventually she hits on the question, well, was he big or was he little? To me, he was big, so I said he was big. 
I later learned that that brother that she identified to her parents got kicked out of the house. And the next time I was over at her place, it became apparent that it was actually the younger brother and not the older big brother that, that molested me. And that moment when I realized what a horrible mistake I had made, I still carry with me, filled me with shame and horror. Oh no, what have I done? I am a horrible person. And the key to understanding this is, is that it isn't the severity of the trauma, it's the fact that we have nowhere to go with the feelings. I didn't tell my parents because I was afraid of losing my friend. I didn't tell my friend about the mistake I made because I didn't want to lose her. And uh, I'll be brief with my uh, quick histo history. Um, I'm a only son with three sisters, uh, a mother and uh, a classic binge drinking Irish alcoholic who was uh, a good guy when he was not drinking, but when he, when he drank uh, and binged, um, he became the closest thing to Satan as I could possibly imagine as a child. It was, it was nights of absolute uh, craziness, violence, uh, police, uh, I won't go into all the, all the story of that, but just to, just what I came out of that with was just completely, absolutely believing that there was something uh, drastically wrong uh, with our genes, our family, and that, that we were flawed, particularly the male lineage of, of which I was a member of, uh, and that we didn't belong, that you're never going to be able to be legitimately part of something. The only way I could envision surviving in life is to run everything, which I started, I started Clearmont. But just to be accepted, to be part, uh, would be, was a huge, huge, huge question in my life. So you can imagine, just to dovetail back to that story, but just to, that's what, that's what I'm facing. What am I, what am I looking for evidence of in that moment in that hotel room in the middle of the night when I knew I'd give a, have to give a talk the next day? It's over, Dwayne. Like this is proving, proving that you do not belong. You're flawed. Give it up. Die. We feel disconnected in those moments from the love that we need to survive. And it's really terrifying, whether it's obviously traumatic or more subtle. And in that moment, we literally start to believe that who we are is not good enough. It's unlovable in some way. And we learn to separate thinking from feeling because it's the feeling that's so uncomfortable. And yeah. it's the feeling that we put into the basement. And as we're wandering around the world in adult, as adults, we have a certain intellectual understanding about who we are. And it often differs from how we feel. This is the dilemma facing many, many people who end up coming into our counseling rooms. <laughs> we all have our little shelf help section at home and we know better up here. And our solution to what we know logically, that these, that it is not true that we're not good enough, that we are good enough, we know it logically. I just don't feel it. <laughs> and our solution is often to try and argue with our feelings and talk ourselves Why aren't I happy? Feelings. I have the perfect husband in the house and the job and the kids, but I don't feel it. What's wrong? And so we end up in this inner argument between what we know to be true and how we feel. And we are, we, this is the loop. And it is the feelings that give what we hold in the basement, that mistaken belief, I want to emphasize mistaken, so much power. So in the very moment where we take on these suspicions about ourselves, believing that we're flawed in some way, we think to ourselves, okay, so what do I have to do now in order to survive? Who do I have to become? And we try behavior A, it doesn't work. Behavior B doesn't work. Behavior C, bingo. So who I really am, there's something wrong with that me. I'm going to become behavior C. So two examples, what I decided from my behavior C, mistakes are obviously terrible, so I'm just not going to make any, thank you. I am going to become a perfectionist. I'm going to do everything as well and as perfectly as I possibly can. Secondly, I am going to learn how to please everybody. 
we, we term this in our work over functioning, meaning that if every relationship adds up to 100%, it's healthy for you to do 50% of that, 100% of your 50%. We over functioners tend to take over. Like we do give, give, them, give them a number, yeah, 90, Catherine. <laughs> Be 95. honest. Sometimes let, you can get me, higher than that. Let me take care of that. Oh, no, no, I can do that. I'll jump it's in. Like, I'll do that it's like you. we're playing a ten, a, you know, it's like we're playing a game of tennis, and I hit the ball over to her, and she hits it back to me, but she runs over to my side of the court and hits it back to herself. And I know there are some of my people out there. I know that you must be out there somewhere. But I, but I never learned how to play <laughs> tennis. And, and, and figuratively, I don't learn how to be in a relationship then either because you're doing it all. Mm -hmm. And these strategies that we develop, these are just a couple of examples just to get you thinking. These hide, pretend, defend strategies that are meant to cover up what we're feeling in the basement, they end up only creating the very feelings that they're defending against. So this might be obvious, for example, uh, when you're angry and you're obviously defensive and bristly and prickly and picking a fight, you know that you're not likely to get a good response when you were like that. The same is true of pretty looking strategies like overfunctioning. The cry of the overfunctioner is this, I give and I give and I give, how come nobody ever considers me? And the answer to that question is because you train everybody not to. <laughs> and so these strategies tend to create the very experience that we're trying to get away from over time. And the important part about this as well is that what we're holding in the basement, we start to become less aware of because the strategies we've developed are like a knee jerk response to that feeling. I get this, my self-doubt is triggered, these feelings, oh no, maybe I'm not good enough, the, the fear, the anxiety, <gasps> overfunction right away. Oh, let me, what do I have to do to take care of that? What do I have to do? And so we may or may not be aware of what's driving the behavior because the behavior becomes so automatic. You, you become an expert where you hang out. So if it's in hide and pretend and defend, you become an expert in hiding and pretending and defending as opposed to dealing with those feelings that are actually needing to be dealt with. And what happens in our lives when we repeat a pattern over time is kind of like what happens with water on a landscape. So raindrops, that are dripping onto rock form a particular kind of landscape over time and that sculpted pathway then determines what way the water goes over and over and over again. And in the same way, these kind of repeated patterns that we start establishing in our lives, in our relationships, because of how we're being, form a patterned way of state of consciousness in our brains, literally. So literally, this is what neural pathways are. <laughs> we said earlier that emotions color our perceptions and that what we pay attention to is mediated through our emotional network. So neural pathways, these little pathways that get sculpted by these experiences, neural pathways are created and facilitated by something called neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters are chemicals like serotonin, like dopamine, like epinephrine, like oxytocin, and all these chemicals are associated with emotions and feeling. They are the neurochemicals of feeling. And our perceptual wiring, the way we see the world, gets hooked up through our emotional network. And that emotional network is determined by our experiences yesterday and as a child. So our emotional states are literally mechanisms for activating this automatic circuit mm -hmm. inside of us, which generates our behavior. Our fear and anxiety in the basement trigger our strategies and our defenses. And these strategies tend to create the kind of experiences that we actually are defending against. And it's these, these neural pathways that are activated when we run into an obstacle that triggers us in the basement, right? My, you can imagine me in that hotel room contemplating the next morning what is getting activated and fired. I am now returning to all the horror of my life and all, 
all the neurochemistry that's taking place, the neural pathways that are activated are on mobilization. Self-doubt is a knock on the door to our basement. As I said earlier, this is, it feels like a curse because it's painful, but it's actually a profound opportunity because it's also a window. When else are you going to see what you need to deal with other than when you're in one of these states? So as we mentioned earlier, all graduations are preceded by a crisis and this is it. This is where it happens. You can't graduate without a crisis. Why would you? You're fine and dandy. I'm fine exactly the way everything is. But when you get to a crisis, your program isn't working anymore. So you actually invite a new program. This is where the action is. This is where it's at. This is where you are actually become more of that acorn becoming its, its oak tree in these places. So this, this requires learning to let ourselves feel again without doing something right away, so quick, to fix the feeling the moment it hurts. That fix, we think, is the solution, but now it becomes the problem, and it blocks anything new from happening. We are just on Groundhog Day. That's what that entire movie is about, is this. That feeling is a doorway to the basement. We have postulated that it only takes 15 minutes to change the course of your life in relationship or your business, if in one of these moments where all of this is activated, that you actually reflect legitimately letting yourself feel rather than reload your defensive strategy. And I want to say about feelings. Feelings are really uncomfortable. The, the kind of feelings we're talking about can be really uncomfortable. And I swear to you, nobody has ever died from feeling uncomfortable. I swear and I promise it has never happened. There are people that have died defending against yeah. feeling uncomfortable. When we do something, we can do very destructive things when we feel uncomfortable. But learning how to let ourselves feel uncomfortable and be with that feeling is a really, really, really important skill, particularly as it relates to resilience. So again, reflect versus reload. Because when we start reflecting, we're going to start asking ourselves some questions. What am I making this mean? Just like when in my life. What am I reenacting here? What am I looking for? Where is this coming from? Some really, really important uh, self-reflective questions that when we're busy in our hide, pretend, and defend, and, and, and in defensive strategy all the time, we never stop to ask ourselves some really, really uh, soul-birthing questions that all these, these difficult moments are actually there for. So when you can identify what's being triggered in your basement, when you can kind of be still with the feelings and ask yourself, okay, what am I making this mean? Where did I make this up originally? What old story in my life is this actually connected to? When you can identify that, you have an opportunity to rewrite and correct that old story. And again, not just intellectually, but emotionally. When I'm working with my clients, I often ask them to picture the child they were in that just like when story or if it's hard for them to picture themselves, to picture a child of the same age as when whatever it was that happened actually happened. Picturing a child for many people creates a different kind of emotional connection there because a child's innocence is obvious. And particularly as adults, we often have a really instinctive caring response. It's easy to see the innocence in a child, even though it can be hard to see the innocence in the person looking in a mirror back at us. When you can picture the child you were, it's really easy to see the innocence. Another trick I use with my clients is to, in the middle of self-doubt is to get them talking to themselves as if they're their own best friend mm -hmm. because we can be so mean to ourselves in those moments. So, so mean. But you never talk to your friend that way. Never, never. And there's many, many powerful ways that we can connect and correct 
that painful old story. That is this this slide is the basis of all the work that we do at Claremind, connection and correction. And vulnerability is key to the process. And ideally inviting another human being into this process with you. Roger, mm -hmm. you asked me earlier, what, what is real connection? It is this, letting somebody be with you in the place that you're vulnerable. If you think about all the times in your life that somebody has been legitimately vulnerable with you as, a, as another human being, your heart automatically opens. That's a natural occurrence for us as human beings. We care for someone who is vulnerable. And vulnerability invites connection. It is the feeling of connection. When you're brave enough to be vulnerable, you have revealed yourself to another human being, you look into their eyes and you can see acceptance and caring and compassion. That moment changes how you feel about yourself. So the feeling of connection literally pulls us out of the basement and back into life again. Mm -hmm. That little acorn that kind of got stunted at this particular point in time is now back in the flow of life again. And it is extremely powerful to do that with another human being. It's also possible to do it with yourself, imagining that person that you were then. And you can do it with the three seconds that Roger was referring to earlier. Think about what you could fill that three seconds with. So when you can differentiate the past from the present in those moments, and I mean fully, meaning you're, you're correcting the emotions that are attached to the self-doubt and you've moved to the other side of it. That's when you open to the new possibility that's actually in front of us. That actually activates what we refer to as positive neuroplasticity. New networks are actually formed and those new networks allow you to perceive different information in your environment as well. So out of these two steps, uh, letting yourself feel and reflecting rather than reloading will come new authentic action. It'll be, it's necessarily going to be different. It won't be strategic. It'll be real. So to come back to my story. We promised we would come back. Yeah. Um, I, st I, I was up the entire night and I'm completely uh, void of any resources or any escape other than just saying I'm, I'm, I'm not going to show. God only knows the world I would have fallen into then. But I decided, oh, it was a long, long night, um, reflecting on my entire life and what I was confirming about my self-suspicion and realized as I revisited my childhood that through all those, those horrible experiences, I also felt a calling. And that was that there has to be something, there has to be another way. There has to be. And I was driven by that through all of my uh, bad experiences as a child and going into adolescence and becoming a musician and wanting to write music that inspired people and studying psychology. There has to be another way. I decided that that is my soul. That is... I am going to give this talk today. And even if I have 400 people running out of the room, and even if this is the end of it, that they've, they've closed our company and there is no chance, and I'm just gonna have to spend the rest of my life going into bankruptcy and paying it back. I am not letting go of this. This is me. This is all I have. It's the only thing that is ultimately completely real for me and I, so I'm going to give that talk and I gave that talk well of course I'm fighting my demons through the whole thing like give it up give it up stop it the more I heard the voice the more I got inspired and I gave the talk and for the first time in my career up to that point I got a standing ovation that pretty much didn't stop it was astonishing and there I am witnessing this versus witnessing the call about the GST and Revenue Canada 
you know, which ABC or, or 12, 13, 4, what is this? What world is this? And I stayed in it. All of this um, is about, this is, this is the next part of our, our lecture, is once we reflect, feel, reflect, step in, where I step in into this, I'm letting myself have this feeling. I'm going to step in and I'm going to stay in. I'm not going to leave it. I'm going to enter this new playing field, whatever it is. I'm going to step in, I'm going to stay in, and I'm going to start looking around. Okay, get this. Step in, stay in, look around. My next stop was in Sweden, where we had already been, and I gave a, a lecture there. On, it's part of my tour, and I had a small community there, and after the lectures, we always would get together for, for a beer or with a small group of the people that were involved in, in ClearMind then, 15 or 20 people were sitting around a table having food and snacks. And one of them says to me, so how's it going at ClearMind? I haven't told any part of the story, not in London, I didn't. How's it going at ClearMind? And my fear-based part rose and you, you can't tell them about what's going on here. That's gonna scare them away. That will, if ClearMind isn't already dead, it's now gonna really die. You can't tell them about this. But I did tell them about this. I just said, you know, we got a, uh, our bank account seized. We've been uh, delinquent in our payments for taxes and uh, we can't even run our business right now. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. I was just real and I think in the whole table, I, I had their attention. Like it was one of those moments where everything stopped it was just so real. People saw who I was. They witnessed me. I witnessed them witnessing me step in, stay in. I am now looking around. What is this world? Who am I in this? Who is this? Who are they? Are they just bums going into seats for our business? No, they're human beings that have connected with me, that care about me, and I care about them, and I'm in the middle of a dilemma. So, and there's no answers. You know, we've often say, don't measure your success uh, by how you deal most effectively with a conflict or a difficulty. Measure your success actually by who you're becoming. Because that's just what success ultimately is going to be in life, is, is who you are and who that's going to attract, who you really are. So I stayed the night. And Bill, the sponsor in Stockholm, drove me to the airport the next morning. And he was actually uh, American slash Swedish. He had an American father and a Swedish mother. And they broke up when they, he, he was born in California. And so he moved to Sweden, but he never knew his father. They broke up at, at his birth. But he had just learned that he had died. His father had died. And he was, he was granted $30,000 in uh, the will. And he said, you know, I was struggling to, I, 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 what to do with this? And I want to, I want to invest in ClearMind. I mean, this was a wonderful, wonderful bonus. It, like this was, this was the ultimate good ending to this story, but I already had my good ending, even if it didn't succeed in terms, in terms of the next chapter of my life. That was phenomenal. But I will tell you, if I, if that night before in London, if I defaulted to my, fall into my fate rather than rise into my destiny and listen to all the evidence to support that I never would have found out if I didn't step in, stay in and keep looking around, keep looking around, keep looking around. What else is here? What is this new world that I never knew anything about from my childhood? I would never would have, I never would have got to that place where Bill would have invested that money and clear mind, obviously, continued and here we are today quite quite a remarkable successful company and i, and I will add in the practical terms we've learned to deal with government <laughs> agencies yes. and gsts these were also important lessons involved in the whole get in the evolution <laughs> of our company so this this movement literally is what helps us to continue with neuroplasticity. We continue to grow. We continue to move through these and, and become more than what we have been. Open up to new possibilities.
So from that place, <laughs> anything is possible. We finish with a quote from Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll, who wrote that said, why sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible <laughs> things before breakfast. Can you imagine that waking up in the morning as adults and just giving your time to have imagined six impossible things before breakfast? <laughs> and that, that, back to returning right back to where we began that is what it takes ultimately to be able to tap into that force for evolution to allow this yeah. acorn to continue becoming an oak tree throughout our lives <laughs> because just because we're adults doesn't mean it stops it continues and it continues and it continues and life will continue to hand us many opportunities to recalculate and to continue becoming. that's for sure <laughs> guaranteed that's going to happen so just in terms of resources, if you want to follow up with us, our book is available um, as an e ebook, as a hard, cop hard copy, and also on Aud Audible. And you can also check us out at clearmind.com. There's lots of free resources on our website, as well as information. Tons of lectures. We have a Clearmind channel. Yeah, information on our workshops, et cetera. So feel free to follow up and check us out. And there we go. Well, <clears throat> that was um, a beautiful talk. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thank you for sharing a very fresh perspective on life. Mm. <laughs> uh, now, we do have a couple of minutes. If there's Excellent. anyone who has any questions of uh, Catherine or Dwayne, this is the time to ask them. Yeah, bear in mind that we don't, when we're doing our presentation, we're not seeing the chat or anything else other than our PowerPoint. So uh, we're not aware of what was the 57 right. well, th Thus far, there has been nothing in the chat. So if you do have a question, feel free to unmute and ask your question of Catherine and Dwayne. I'm. Uh, Aaron says, this is amazing. You're getting lots of accolades. Yay. Oh, uh, one of the best talks at VBN. Um, Thank you, Aaron. Is, is there any, anything you can add that is uniquely specific to entrepreneurs in, in, in how we uh, uh, as well, a subspecies? That's why I kept referring to even your three, your three second uh, first impression. Like, this everything we're talking about business the su business involves relationships the success of businesses are determined by the quality of the relationships you actually have not just by the quality of your product and if you're incapable of bring, you know i choose to to hire people and work with people that i'm actually feel something from i know who they are they've touched me or i've touched them there's something that i want to to be part of and that's because I know who they are, legitimately, authentically. Even, you know, Roger, if it was the first time I came on here tonight and, and watched you moderate, the moment you said to Jamie, uh, commented about his daughter, mm -hmm. you went, you know, you went completely off your, your, your format and your schedule and you actually showed, you, you cared about him and his daughter by making a comment that was so genuine and so real and I felt it. I just felt the track. This this is the kind of person I want to be involved in because you showed who you are while you run your business. It wasn't strategic. It wasn't a strategy. It was just authentic. It was beautiful, and I think that holds true for every aspect of business. You know what happens to you in the face of difficulty in business? Do you stay in relationship? Do you let people? Do you continue to know people and let them know you as opposed to get defensive and strategic and scared? Mm -hmm. yeah, beautiful thinking, beautiful thinking. Uh, there are no further questions, so Excellent. allow me on behalf of Vancouver Business Network to thank you from the bottom of my heart for this expose on how we think and how we could think better and how we could become more resilient in the face of adversity. Oh, thank and you. Thank the you. timing of your talk was impeccable. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. And thank audience, Thank you for giving us your time and your trust and your Tuesday evening. Lots of teas there.
And with that, uh, I normally would say safe home, but since you are home, I, I don't have to say that. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the uh, video of uh, Catherine and Dwayne's talk will be made public uh, uh, sometime tomorrow morning. Uh, so feel free to review it and share it with everybody else in your life who you feel could benefit from it. Yeah. Good night, Dwayne, Catherine. Good thank you, thank audience. you, thank you. It's been a little, si little slice of pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, guys. It was amazing. Thank you. Thank Love you so it. much. Thank you.